Hi everyone and woman Jika. My name is Chiminda Ranasinghe. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at RMIT University. Uh, before we get started today, I would like to acknowledge the Woiwurrung and Wunrong language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations, whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. Our RMIT University respectfully acknowledges uh, their ancestors and elders past and present. RMIT also acknowledges the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. Now, thank you so much for being with us today um, as we kick off uh, what I would call postgraduate week or month. Uh, it's such an exciting time as we go through what is, I, I would suggest, uh, a very unusual period for everybody. And um, events like this is a great chance for us to hear from fantastic speakers and, and today we've got uh, a fantastic speaker. But um, the important piece to note is that there are a number of virtual events that are going to be taking place uh, over the next few weeks covering a number of broad topics uh, with some fantastic speakers uh, from a number of different industries. So I would encourage you to take a look at uh, the different topics that we're about to cover. We'll provide some information uh, on the chat in the Q&A in a minute where you can see the the, the detail there. Now tonight um, I'm delighted the, the special guest uh, that is joining us is one of our prominent uh, alumni and importantly is someone that I have followed for a, for a fair while simply because of the common interests that we have, uh, not just because uh, they're an RMIT alumna, but also because on Channel 9 they look after things like the Australian Open or, or presenters of the Australian Open. Uh, and for my two sons, very much uh, a fan because of uh, the co-host on uh, Ninja Warrior, which is something that I have to be very much on top of these days. Uh, and also on today's show on the weekends, and and I'm delighted, of, of course, given the weekend, uh, we're given Geelong's fantastic win. This person happens to be Geelong's number one ticket holder as well. So I'd love to welcome Rebecca Madden to our first event today. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Chiminda, and what, what a beautiful introduction. And yes, if anyone's a Geelong supporter out there, I know it, today's not about football, but I do have a big smile on my face still. <laughs> and, and, and you should be beaming, and I must admit, if probably like most Victorians, uh, we would uh, probably be jumping on the bandwagon uh, behind Geelong, so you should be beaming, and I couldn't take my eyes off uh, the TV, simply because being an Essendon fan myself, as you know, we go for anyone uh, you know, who plays Collingwood on the night, so I shouldn't say that, but we were delighted for you. Um, and Rebecca, thank you for, again for joining us. But look, I must admit, when I look at the amazing achievements, your list, which I've got here in front of me, since you left university, you know, everything from your career starting on radio, on Fox and Nova, then your timing at time at seven, and then more recently, obviously, on nine. It's just been an amazing journey. The morning show, uh, you know, being an anchor on news to Ninja Warrior and then to be fair, uh, being a co-host and, and the first female co-host on the footy show, some amazing achievements and of course ongoing. Um, I would love to hear from you about your journey from the lecture theatre and the, the, the fantastic hallways of RMIT and our campus to now obviously in TV studios, being in everyone's lounge room, so to speak. Uh, I would love to hear about your journey. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I, I, the reason I've got such a long list is because I'm actually quite old now. <laughs> so, you know, if you've been around a while, you have a few jobs. <laughs> um, yeah, look, when, when you actually put it, I mean, I don't, you know, walk around saying, you know, congratulating myself, you know, every day on what, what I've achieved. So it's actually strange to actually hear you list all the things that I've done because, um, yeah, I, I obviously went to RMIT after school in, in 95. I know everyone, that's a long time ago for you guys, <laughs> in the 90s. Um, and so I started um, my uh, university, um, actually at Melbourne University, I did a year of arts uh, first, just I don't know why actually, I sort of regret that because it was just a bit of a waste of a year. And then I saw the light and decided to transfer to, to RMIT um, to do, to do media and um, you know I, you know when I was at university and I think a lot of people will be in this position it's very hard to see where you will be in five years time or ten years time or in my case 20 years time now so it, it, it can be really daunting 
but let me assure you, and I will talk about my career and sort of how I got there, but I, I do just want to say from the outset that but let me assure you, if you've been a great student, if you've put in the time and you've put in the work, um, it may not be on the timeline that you want. However, eventually it will happen and you life has a weird way of working out. And maybe at the time, you know, I never thought I'd be, let's just call, for example, co-host of the AFL footy show. I mean, that would be ridiculous for me to, to ever think of or even really a, to aspire to when you know I was generally the audience's age but as I said if you put in the hard work if you've been a good student if you've got a great degree behind you it really does set you up for a fantastic career and a fantastic life ahead so let me go back to how it all started for me in fact my foot into the door started when I was studying um, so I know many of you will have a part-time job and that's really how I got my break um, I had a part-time job <laughs> it wasn't very highbrow I can, can tell you that I I worked at Fox FM and Triple M um, on the weekends at uh, at the radio station but I was um, one of the girls who used to hand out um, chips and coffee <laughs> so there you go you got to start at the bottom and never in my wildest dreams did I think that that would lead to anything that was a great weekend job I made some great friends but you know it was in the media and you know I got to to, to chat to a few people in the hallways and it's just funny how things evolve so um, if you haven't done it already no matter what it is whether it's volunteering on the weekends at something that you think is quite obscure or chatting to your neighbor that has a long lost cousin that does something in the field that you want to do it is worth that conversation so i'm very grateful that i got to hand out chips and coke when i was 20 years of age because believe it or not it actually led to something um so i did that on the weekends that was my part-time job i loved it um, I, I'm not going to step you through the next 20 years, otherwise we'll be here till breakfast time. So I'll make it short for you. But uh, so I started to take an interest in the radio news at the time and I ventured up, got the courage. You've got to have the courage, remember, remember this. I got the courage to walk up the stairs to the newsroom one day and I introduced myself to the news director and I said, oh, I'm quite interested. Um, you know, I'm doing media at RMIT and she said, oh, do you want to be a newsreader? And I said, oh, I haven't thought about it in such detail, but well, maybe. She goes, well, why don't I just, um, you know, give you some tapes. Cut a long story short, she gave me some training. One day there was, someone was sick, there was a little bit of opening and, you know, I was probably on air at three o'clock in the morning when no one was listening, but that was my very first break. And it was only because I had the courage to go upstairs and ask, you know, is there anything for me? Could I do some work, some training? Um, I got a job there and then uh, she was poached by another brand new radio station. Um, believe it or not, um, Nova, the radio station didn't exist um, <laughs> 20 years ago. It was a brand new station and she went across there as the news director and she took me across with her. So that was my first proper job. Uh, I was there about 18 months and then I very strangely and very, I was very, very fortunate, got a phone call um, from somebody at Channel 7. This doesn't happen very often these days and I realise and I reflect on this time and I probably didn't appreciate it to the full extent that I should have back then but I got a phone call I went and did a screen test and I got a job at Channel 7 and that really kick-started me into all of the things that Chaminda said um, you know in my introduction and yes I've had some wonderful opportunities but it was it was a long hard slog to get there I mean I for the first six years at Channel 7. I worked every single Christmas day, every single Boxing Day, every single day that you don't want to be working, I was at work. Um, so you have to put, you know, you have to put in the long hours and you do have to make the sacrifices if you want to get somewhere, you know, in, in your career. I, I, I just, I don't believe that people get the opportunities. People are lucky in life, but I think lucky people really put in the hard work if you, you really dig deep. Um, so I was afforded so many wonderful opportunities there and it's it's also I think um, it seems at the time when you're in it and when you get that first job or, or whatever it may be it seems like you're never going to progress. Um, I look back on it now and I think it happened so quickly but at the time you do have frustrations that you can't get to the next step quick enough um, my advice here would be just, you know, enjoy the ride because even though you're getting frustrated, 
there are so many things that with the magic of hindsight that you learn along the way that are actually setting you up unbeknownst to you at the time that are actually setting you up to take that next step. My really big step, I was at Channel 7 for 13 and a half years. I absolutely loved my job. Um, and I worked on sort of two or three years co contracts and the stars aligned and I was coming out of contract. Not that I wasn't going to be um, re-signed, but there was, there was a window there and there was an opening at Channel 9. And um, I was employed to be uh, the co-host on the AFL footy show, a show that um, last year was taken off air, but had a 25 year run and in the Australian media, I'm pretty sure that's some type of record for a show to be on air for 25 years and, you know, be extremely successful. Love or hate the footy show, you have to give it credit for being, you know, on air for so long, 25 years. Um, so that was uh, the, a huge step for me, an absolutely huge step for me. And I, I was, you know, making that that step in my career in my late 30s. So while I look back and I wanted to do it all at 25, I wasn't experienced enough to do it all at 25. So take your time, be patient. So I really truly got my huge break in my career in my late 30s. Um, my move to Channel 9 has opened so many doors here. Um, I um, was lucky enough to be also the first female host of the Australian um, Australian Open tennis men's final, um, not last year, the year before, which was has never been done on Australian television before, which I know you look back and think, think why, but um, Channel 9 just got the rights and they put me in the main seat, which was a tremendous honour. Um, and also there was this little show that came up called Australian Ninja Warrior, which was totally unfamiliar to me. Um, I was totally out of my depth. I've never commentated on sport before. I've never really been in that prime time sort of slash entertainment sort of field. Um, but I've learned something in, you know, my 20 plus years of being in the media, uh, and that is never say no, <laughs> because they won't ask you again. So if there's an opportunity there, and this I think goes with life, there'll be opportunities that you think I'm not qualified for, I don't have the experience for, um, but you'll be fine. Just say yes, and and it'll be all right. And that's, that's sort of where my career is at the moment. And then in the last sort of 12 months, um, an opportunity um, came up to host the Weekend Today show on, on Channel 9, which suits me in terms of my work-life balance. I've, I've got a, a toddler at the moment. Um, so that works fantastic to be on air two days a week with my other sort of commitments throughout the year. And, and that's where I am. So that's sort of 20 years in five minutes. What a fantastic. <laughs> no, but it's a fantastic journey, Rebecca. And, and there's a few things that you mentioned that I want to highlight, which is so important in today's context. And the first thing that you said was that there's no linear journey. You don't set out and say, here's exactly my path and I'm going to follow it from start to finish. There's no such thing. And I think your journey is such an inspiration. And to be fair, I don't think we should joke about age I'm of a similar vintage. Um, we all started thinking, oh, you know, my dad or mum had a, a job for life. It's no longer the, the case. You know, you, you've got to think about the journey where you continue to learn and try different things because your your journey will take you on different paths. So I think that's a fantastic story. I also love that you had uh, your job at Fox was part way through your, your course. So that integrated experience with study and work together I think is so important. And the final piece, I, I, I think courage is is such an important, you've got to take the chances, you've got to be brave uh, and never say never, always take something that's given to you and, and give it your best shot. Those are love, there's such great yeah. Um, yeah. lessons. Yeah, and I, if I can just um, extend on something there that I, that I just thought, even though all of those shows and all of those things that I've done in my life seem fantastic, there's been some lows. I've been taken off some shows. The trajectory of your career does not go like this. There are ups and downs. I've lost positions because a boss didn't think I was good enough or somebody else they wanted to promote. And, you know, I got demoted. You know, that has happened to me time and time again. And one of the main reasons I left Channel 7 and actually went to Channel 9 and took that opportunity was the fact that I really plateaued at Channel 7 and there wasn't really, um, whether it be the management all the time or whatever it was, um, I was sort of had become part of the furniture. So sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and take that, that, take that next step and put yourself in a position to take that next step and, and, and be brave. But, um, you know, I haven't been too courageous, I think, 
throughout my career, I look back on my career and say, I should have actually put my hand up for that. I should have actually asked for that, even though I've been very fortunate. Um, so if I had my time again, I probably, you know, would have been a bit more brash early on. <laughs> Good advice. Um, let me go back a little bit uh, towards the early part of your career, Rebecca, and, and the Quill Award, which is such a prestigious award, and you 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 received that very early in your career. Uh, I think it was when you were probably first, uh, you know, when you started your journey as a presenter. I'd love to hear your sort of reflections on achieving that, but also what you took away from your time at RMIT. So what were the lessons you learned, not just in the classroom, but the sort of overall experience i'd love to hear about you know what prepared you from your lessons at rmit to achieving that award as an example yeah it's it's a it's a great question because when you're at university um and you 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 know further education sometimes you're thinking how does this actually apply to the real world i i know when you're, you're 20 years of age you're thinking you're looking at your book and you're thinking, is this really going to help me? Well, trust me, it does. Maybe not exactly, you know, the words on the page are not going to help you in five years time, but what it sets you up to do is think outside the square. I don't know about everybody's, um, you know, senior, senior school education, but I feel that the, you know, from, you know, years 10, 11, 12, you're trained to think this is my totally my perspective. I'm sure people will disagree, but my schooling, um, and maybe it's different these days, but it was very much in a box. And when you go to, you know, RMIT, for example, um, you get taught how to think outside the box. And for me, that first year, that concept was completely daunting. I was terrified actually to go to my lectures and my tutorials because I didn't know how to, this sounds weird, I didn't know how to think like that. That's exactly what higher education does. It teaches you to think in a different way. So um, you mentioned the Quill Award. So I got the Quill Award for, um, for my bushfire coverage. Um, we were in a very bad situation up uh, in the Alpine National Park in a place called Omeo. We'd been up there a couple of days, nothing much was happening. And then one morning I woke up at um, seven o'clock in the morning, the sky was pitch black. Everything was black. I was with my cameraman and just me, just me and my cameraman. And every most people had been evacuated from the towns. It was a very, very bad summer of bushfires. Um, and uh, the sky was completely black. The sun never came up. It was pitch black at 11 o'clock in the morning. And we spoke to the fire officers and they said the fire is coming. In fact, the township of Omeo is surrounded on by three fire fronts. Um, and your safest bet, Rebecca, and my cameraman, Will, um, who is a good friend of mine uh, still, um, said the best bet for you is the people that are left in the town that haven't evacuated are going to the football oval. And we've got one tanker of water there and we should be okay. Should is not a word you want to hear when you've got three fire fronts surrounding you. We were very lucky that at the very last minute, probably 15 minutes before that huge bushfire was coming towards us, we had a wind change and we were saved by that. Um, my coverage, as you mentioned, got a, got a Quill Award for that. But how do I, you know, how do I talk about, you know, winning an award like that and being in a situation like that? And um, you know, my, my my learnings at RMIT, well, they actually align quite well because as I said earlier, you're in a situation that you've never been in before. And it actually reminded me of, you know, my first day of going to RMIT, I was in a situation that, that, that I'd never been in before. The first day I walked through the doors at Channel 7, I was nearly sick with anxiety about what I was about to walk into. My first day uh, walking out on the set in front of a live audience of 400 people to host the AFL footy show, something that a female has never done before, um, that feeling was the same. So I've had that feeling over and over and over again. And how, you know, it's like a marathon. Um, you have to train for it and, and, and you do it. And that whole feeling of that first year at RMIT, in those moments that I feel my most anxious going into those situations and that would be a bushfire. I'd never covered a bushfire before. I didn't know what I was doing, but you have to think outside the square. And that's what RMIT and higher education does for you. You 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 need to think on the spot. You need to think laterally. You need to use your resources and, and 
that's exactly what RMIT did for me. That's the biggest thing I took away from, from my education there. What a wonderful example. I so I mean I so understand what you you mean, and particularly for people thinking about progressing their careers or changing their careers, it can be daunting because you're thinking about you know you might have been in a certain role for a long time. So what do I do? What are the next steps? And I think it's so great to hear you speak about taking those uh, courageous steps to step back into learning because I think that is what then helps you take those next steps. And the reality is, you're right. It's not just the technical skills. That's not why you go back in to learn uh, certain things that could be part of it, but certainly there's so much more to it than simply learning about those technical skills. Uh, and I must say when you were speaking about only oh, I've got family in, in Gippsland and even just this summer, Rebecca, that that ability for us and for you to be able to tell those stories, that's so important. I'm so glad that the the experience that you had at RMIT enabled you to do that. Because that's something that you continue to do even now. So let's now go to something uh, probably as challenging, but you've overcome this. You've spoken a lot about uh, being a female in a fairly male dominated industry and in, traditionally, particularly in, in areas like sport, and you talked about the footy show and the tennis, it has been challenging. I'd love to hear about your certain, I mean, your experience, but how you've overcome that and what your guidance or advice might be to, to others looking to follow your own footsteps. Yeah, just by way of background, um, I have five brothers. <laughs> um, I have three stepbrothers and two brothers. Although, as as you think, oh well, you you know you're always surrounded by by men. You know, growing up, I, all my brothers are a lot older than me. So, sort of in my teenage years, everybody had left home. So, even though I've got five brothers, I was almost sort of raised as as an only child. Not an afterthought, but I, I'm sort of almost raised as as an only child. But um. But, but a lot of my childhood was was around sport, was around, you know, heaps of blokes in the house, if I, you know, I can use that language. Um, but I will say, you know, in my career, very, you know, media is changing and we see far more women, you know, on boards and there's, we're far more conscious of that. And, you know, and that is a great thing. And women are put in, you know, this this is not particularly my job, but as a society, we are, we are, desperate to, to even out things and equal out things and, and that should be applauded. But I when I started at Channel 7, just by way of example, um, you know, I, I have never actually had a female boss. Um, their Channel 9 is far better of it. We, we you know, of 50% of their board members are females. So <laughs> that's a great start. But my direct bosses, I've never, um, I've never had a female. So that's just a, you know, interesting observation from from the outset that you know in high management um it's always been men um look there are a lot of people that have um I, I think i've been really fortunate there's a lot of people that don't have um great experiences in the media because it is very male dominated um and you know it, it's probably not an industry for for you know a wallflower you, you do have to be pretty confident and you do have to back yourself and that's not to say you know i don't get in the car or i you know at home thinking oh my gosh what i've done but you do have to you know just go out there and you know prove your stuff and i truly believe even to this day that women have to do the same job better than a man to be recognized as an equal Unfortunately, that's how I I feel. Um, so I think I have to try 10 or 20% harder than my male colleagues to be on equal footing. Um, I know, well, I, 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 this is an assumption, but I think I do more work, um, more preparation, so I achieve just that. That's unfair, but I, I truly think that that's my experience. Um, and another example of that is, um, and if I can use the AFL footy show, if one of the boys, the boys on the panel, Billy Brownless or Shane Crawford or Sam Newman or whoever the, my co-host would be at the time, said a little mistake about the football, like everyone would laugh or, you know, but if I said a mistake about, you know, a game or I got a score wrong or I got a player's first name wrong or something, whatever silly, silly thing it may be, um, I always got criticised. So that's just an example of how women are still judged unfairly um, in the media. Um, I, some people think it's a disadvantage being um, 
a female in the media, I think that's really been flipped on its head. And I think I've been given many opportunities, particularly in my latter half of my career, because I've actually been a woman. Because we, the, the, the community has changed, society has changed. And if they see a panel of six men now on television, it looks a bit odd. Um, so we are conscious of that now. So I think I've been actually afforded many positions um, of late and particularly at Channel 9 because I've been female. So I'm not going to say no to that. I'm going to use that um, at, at, to my advantage. Um, I don't believe I was given the job because I was female and I wasn't as good. I think in the positions that I've been given, I was the best person for the job. Um, but I don't think that... I think that, you know, that the mix of things have changed. Five years ago, if anyone watches Fox Footy and people love football, um, you know, they, they always had females involved, but they never had them in the main chair. They never had them doing the main role. We see Sarah Jones, who's fantastic on, if you watch Fox Footy, she, you know, hosts all of the big games now. But five years ago, she wasn't. But now females have been given the main role and it's changing and it's getting better every single year. Thanks. And I couldn't agree with you more. We have to uh, realise that diversity of, of in every aspect, diversity is going to help you. Everything, everything. You, you know, particularly, you know, I mean, I've been lucky, Rebecca, I actually currently report into a brilliant uh, female leader um, and I have had a number of opportunities in my career to do that. Um, and I think every time I have learned so much and it's not a gender issue here, it's just I think particularly in the current moment that we are in across the world, during crisis, organisations must realise that having great diverse leadership will help you come out of this crisis. And that's been proven before during the GFC, during other times of difficulty. Uh, I think you're so right. And women in leadership is something that we all have to play a, a role in. Uh, and you're a great role model. So thank you so much for those wise words. And if I then stick to the point around the crisis. I, thought, I don't think we're going to, we can't avoid a conversation around the current crisis, Rebecca, so I hope you don't want me asking. So in the context of a positiveness, let's think about the post-pandemic world. As we come out of this world, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts around how you believe education will play a role. And in, in your context, how has education played a role in progressing your career? Uh, not just at the start of our and school, but on an ongoing basis, I'd love to hear your thoughts around how we come out of this and how education has, uh, you know, helped you forge your career. You know, higher education has been so important. We've been finding, I mean, in my career in the media, we have been tapping into every single expert in their field that we have been, you know, every single epidemiologist in, in, in Melbourne and the country has been run off their feet. Um, so... I think, you know, there's there's lots of professions and maybe that, you know, have been sort of backroom professions that we haven't heard of a lot. But I think this pandemic has thought we we now put this emphasis on people that are that are experts in their field. And I think that's a massive change too. I mean, yes, of course they've always been there, but I think publicly they should they've really got the recognition that that they now deserve. Would you agree with that? I absolutely I absolutely agree with you. I think it's a case of finding the experts, but the people who are willing to put themselves out there and talk about the circumstances is so great to see they're coming out of their, I would say in some ways, their shell. In, in many ways, some of our scientists, our researchers, the, the people that we should be putting on a pedestal and listening to, uh, we're doing far more of that now, which probably leads me to the next question. I mean, most people who are probably listening tonight and who will be watching this are considering returning to study. They'll be probably thinking about as I mentioned earlier, progressing their careers or changing their careers and thinking about study as a way to do that. Uh, but often, as I'm sure you're aware, people have reservations. Is it the right time for me? Uh, is it the right thing for me to do right now? It's all its all those sort of, as you know, the little gremlins in the back of your head that sort of question, is it, you know, is it right for me timing wise? Can I do it? You talk about work-life balance. I'd love to hear your thoughts and your advice to people. You know, you already mentioned it about being brave and taking on uh, every chance that you've been given, but also is it about going out and seeking those opportunities? I'd love to hear your thoughts and your advice to people who might be considering, you know, study uh, as a sort of part of their career progression. 
Look, I, I, I really truly believe that if you've got that little inkling, if there's something in the back of your mind that says, you know, if you're just thinking about it, then it's probably the right thing to do. <laughs> Um, I, if there's something niggling away at you thinking, I'm just not finished, maybe I should progress, maybe I should do something more, then it's probably, I mean, what have you got to lose? Um, you know, I, I would absolutely. And I, I think um, for me, it, it, it hasn't, you know, my, my career has progressed quite quite quickly and quite rapidly. So I sort of almost never really had the opportunity to, to go back and do that. If I um, had the time, um, to further my education now, I actually would do it because my approach to learning at 43 years of age would be, sorry everybody, would be um, completely different to, to what it was when I was I was 22. Um, I, I would jump at the chance to actually further my education now and I'd probably only be doing it in my situation just for me. Um, but sometimes I think that's enough. Um, if you're doing it just, you know, for you, I, I think that's, you know, fantastic. But I think if you've got a, a little voice in your head saying, maybe I should do this, um, go and do it, I think. Great advice. I, I so agree with you. You know, we, we sometimes do so much for other people or because somebody else told you to do something. I think it's great advice. If there's a passion and you want to do something, absolutely go and do it. And nothing wrong being 43. Rebecca, because uh, I, I share I share that circumstance. Now, listen. Let me. <laughs> let me I everybody, I've just got to say I don't feel it. I feel twenty three, but anyway. <laughs> and that, that is right. Forty three is the new twenty three. You heard it here first, uh, and and this is probably where the next question goes down to the part of fun as well. I think there's someone who wants to find out who your role models were when you were starting your career, particularly in the sports industry. Industry, Rebecca. Oh, I always am real. I'm just always get very scared to answer that question because it's actually not, I, I, I never really thought I want to be that person on television. There was always elements to things that I would love about people. Um, but to be honest, the person that I learned the most, the most from was actually way back when I started in radio and you won't know her, um, but she was actually my boss at the time and she really became my mentor. Um, and she's the one, rather than just sort of idolizing somebody and trying to copy somebody, she was the one throughout my career that actually helped me decide who I wanted to be. Um, and I think through life and whatever job that you, you get and whatever you do in your life, there's one thing that's really important and will take you further than probably anything else, and that's to be authentic. Your authentic self rather than copy somebody or sure you can get inspiration from people, but to be truly good in your position or your job, you have to be who you are. And there's lots of people on television, there's lots of viewers out there in people's lounges that don't like me. That, that's fine. I mean, that's just human nature. Not everybody likes me. I could be very irritating to, you know, half the audience today. Who knows? But um, I have to be me. So it's a different, I don't want to go through a list of people that I admired or, or were inspired by because I want to go back to that person that actually in my early 20s um, actually gave me the skills to develop me. That's a wonderful answer. I mean, I think you're so right because, you know, you need to find mentors in everything that you do in life. And sometimes those people can be literally friends, colleagues, they could be family members. Like you said, your first boss, um, they're the ones who will guide you in both your work life and your personal life. So that's so important. And you're right, authenticity in today's world. And to be fair, regardless of time, it's so important. If you can't be true to yourself, and your beliefs and your values, I don't think you can succeed. And, and I think that is important, Rebecca, particularly if, if people are thinking about their future careers and, and, and changing pathways maybe, as you think about future study, to then think about reaching out to their mentors and, and absolutely being true to themselves. So fantastic. Again, another uh, interesting question here. Um, someone wants to know about how you get connections into the industry. Uh, particularly yours, I'm sure you already mentioned that it's not easy. Um, and, and the second part of that is how they get opportunities to get part time jobs in the sector. Are there any tips that you would provide? Uh, yeah, it's it's really hard. And, and you know, um, 
getting your foot in the door is probably the hardest thing to do. And I, uh, unlike many people, I didn't have, um, to give you, you know, some confidence, I didn't have any connections in the media before I started. I didn't have any family members that, that you know, worked in the media. No one, I didn't know anybody in radio or anybody. Um, so, uh, you know, I got that first um, first job, part-time job, handing out stickers and bottles of Coke, um, you know, through a friend of a friend and never, as I said before, would I thought that that would lead to something. Um, so even though I didn't really value it at the time, I look back on that and think, gee whiz, imagine if I didn't hand out chips and Coke. <laughs> Um, where would I be? Um, so you have to try. That is the hardest thing. And um, some really practical advice I would give you. I know how hard it is um, to, you know, write the email and send it to somebody, you know, asking for some work experience or, you know, trying to, you know, volunteer your time or whatever. Just let me um, remind you of something. Just because you send an email or make a phone call and somebody doesn't reply back to you doesn't mean they don't want you or like you or whatever. I get, I don't know, hundreds of emails a day and hundreds of emails get lost a day. So that's just some practical advice. Just if you never get a reply, be really brave and courageous and go again. Ask, come at it from a different angle, make a phone call, um, do everything you possibly can to make those contacts if you don't have those contacts. And I certainly didn't. Um, you know, talk to people, go to things. If you're invited to something, go. You never know who actually might be there. Tell people what you want to do. Don't expect people in your inner circle or in your wider circle or in your community or whether it be at your netball club or your sporting club or your choir practice that everybody actually knows what you want to do. Everybody's pretty concerned about their own lives, to be honest, and not everybody thinks about what's best for everybody else. Don't expect people to have a crystal ball and know. And this goes for, you know, when you sit in your boss's office, you know, in a few years time and ask for a promotion, don't expect them to know what your goals and aspirations are. You actually have to say it. You have to say it out loud. You have to let people know what you want to do. You have to let people know what your interests are. Um, you have to ask people, have you got some work? Have, can I shadow you? Can I do this? Be really proactive. And I know it's so difficult and at times it's humiliating, um, but you, you need to do it. But I just want you to remember that through your careers that don't expect you know your boss to have a crystal ball and 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 your boss who may be in charge of 50 people how can they have any time in their in their day to honestly think about employee number 101102 and think what's best for that person sometimes you actually have to present them with the option so just keep that in mind throughout your life and throughout your career so true rebecca i mean we all expect and hope our managers are mind readers but they're not let's be fair and fair uh, and i think you're so right um and every job like you said whether whether it be handing out coke and chips or whether it be standing in front of a a, a macca's counter serving someone that is still experience it's customer service so there's many ways to to apply your your experience at all levels to a future career so that's lovely advice uh, maybe one last question and something fun Going back to your RMIT days, everyone's got their favourite pub in the city. Um, do you have one? Do you remember yours? Or oh, is that it's really fun. Well, no, um, because I'm not actually, I'm quite boring. I'm not really a big drinker. And I um, I predominantly sort of lived half my life in Geelong. Ah, so okay. I know, so I did actually a lot of travel. So I didn't sort of, um, I didn't sort of hang around, so to speak. So I sort of did a lot of travel. I would, you know, I, I chose the subjects that were on, you know, the first three days, so I didn't have to go on Thursday, Friday, you know, that old trick. Absolutely. <laughs> and so I didn't sort of hang around a lot. I used to sort of come in and do my thing and then sort of go. So um, no, I, I had a few, you know, favourite clubs in Geelong, but not so much in the city. Sorry to be sound boring, everybody. No, not boring at all. But to be fair, that is exactly what uni life is like. RMIT particularly, you have, it's, it's, there's different things for everybody, particularly if you're looking for post-grad, you can travel, you can work from home, you can study from home, you can come into the city or to the other campuses. It's, uh, it's, it is, that's, that's the opportunity. So Rebecca, thank you so much. 
I'm conscious that uh, we are bang on time and I know that you've got a busy schedule. In fact, I know you're going for a shoot this afternoon, so thank I'm you. I'm going to the MCG, which will be very sad because it's going to be empty. <laughs> it's going to be there. And can you believe if it was any other year, your beloved cats will be playing anyway. We won't go there. But uh, look, I am, again, on behalf of everyone at RMIT, thank you so much for sharing your your uh, not just your your career stories, but your advice uh, and your you know going back to the days when you were at the university. I think that some of the lessons were fantastic. I think the advice to people thinking about uh, your career, there's never a single line. There's always opportunities to try new things and follow your passion, be true to yourself. I think Rebecca talked about being brave, uh, taking every opportunity that you have. Uh, and I think this is what postgraduate study gives you. It gives you an opportunity to step back in, do something that might be of interest, try something different. If not, to give you that extra step to push on with your career. Um, so thank you for joining us. This is one of many more virtual sessions that we have got coming up over the next few weeks. I would encourage you to look at the section on the Q&A. There's a link there for you to, to look at some of the other events. There's a wonderful array of speakers from a number of different sectors. Um, and I would love for you to join us during those sessions. Rebecca, thank you once again. And we oh, look forward to having you. Pleasure. I just want to say thank you, everybody, um, for, for logging on. You know, my just in closing my time at RMIT, I have such fond, wonderful memories. And it truly did set me up for, you know, what I have achieved in, in my career and, and you know, not to sound on myself, but I, I am very proud of what I achieved and I wouldn't have been able to achieve it without a great education. So, um, you know, go forth and conquer everybody, be brave and be courageous. And uh, hopefully you can reflect on, you know, a few things I've said and I'll be that little person in your head one day when you're thinking, should I do it? And you say, Rebecca Madden told me I should, I'm going to. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, Rebecca. Pleasure. Thank you.